I will try to give you my take on the problem of beauty yes, and, and trying to build up to what we did for um, the Biennale. I think the aim of this lecture is simply to update the relationship between painting and architecture and maybe to take on this cliché. I think the cliché about beauty are many, and one is this. Um, and I'll focus in this lecture on a particular issue uh, of photorealism, fantasy, and audience, and how that creates the idea of beauty. Um, um, and I will take um, specific forms of painting to do so. So you will see my projects, but truly I will not talk about the projects. You just read what they are. What I will talk about is um, the relationship between the beholder and the beauty. And let's see if that works. Um, at its beginning, still life was used as a pedagogical exercise to teach the perfect and faithful way to represent reality. Um, this exercise was used to um, measure the ability of students against their masters in the time um, became a way to frame the new and original work. Um, by passing really what the subject matter of the still life exercise is, so basically it doesn't matter if you are using apples and bananas or flowers, it truly really is not about the subject matter but the way in which you relate to it. It's about tools and it's about audience. Um, on the other hand, the living picture, another form of painting, is a representation that is intended for an audience. Uh, its success is me measured in part by the degree to which it generates a theatrical engagement with a wider public. So the realism and familiarity are not viewed as shortcomings, but rather as a crucial um, component of a living picture and a crucial component of its success. Uh, in its way, um, grounded in popular culture and the relationship between artistic production and the viewer's understanding, uh, the living picture, I think, is, again, uh, interesting. And the very existence of the beholder, meaning the audience, emerge in art and theater as a fundamental problem of a stage. And I think the living picture is the moment in painting where the stage is set up. Um, the fact... Uh, that the theatrical really is about the possibility to enter the composition. And um, <laughs> we've done a few theatrical projects, let's say, where you can enter the painting. And I'll show you a few. Um, success is measured by the degree to which it generates a theatrical engagement with the wider public, uh, and they embody a new generation of synthetic environments in which special attention is paid to the literal reproduction of matter and its tactile effects. Um, realism and familiarity are not viewed as shortcoming again, but rather crucial ingredients. The correlation between photorealistic representation and public reaction, I think it's uh, important and interest to architects. Most of the projects I will show you have components of interaction, both optical and digital. Or physical.
and um, talking about audience, uh, this was a project where we worked with all the senses, not only visual senses or tactile, actually worked with uh, perfumes and interaction. It was a project for Sephora. Finally, one project, uh, before we started all the AR, which I will show you in the next lecture, um, that uh, tries to incorporate audience sound uh, and memory uh, into a fairly architectural component, which is just basically a gate of entry to one of the Kimpton Hotel. Um, it's called um, Cabinets of Wonders, um, and I'll show you during the video what happens. So There's a curtain that you enter with a cell phone, so it's a place of imagination. You never enter the, uh, the space, which is actually for electricals. Um, and this is how it works. Thank you. So now will join us the winners of the installation out there in front of the museum. Uh, Sumin Ham, Igor Pantik, and Guilliam Yan, who are just representative of the group. Thank you very much. I think uh, 
uh, it's your turn now, so let's go ahead with it. Hello. I assume we just push this button to go next. Yes, the green one is the... OK, we skipped the first slide, so we're racing straight in. Um, so while the pavilion that we produced is about trying to find a kind of productive tension between very, very primitive tools of construction and very precise digital models, I thought I would, sh with the sort of the result being quite ugly detailing and beautiful objects, I think, from, from, uh, from a distance, I showed, thought I'd show you another project that we've been working on lately, which is really about the opposite. It's about trying to improve the quality um, and skill of quite traditional, maybe prosaic uh, craftsmanship, things like bricklaying. So what we do is we develop ho intelligent holographic instructions for construction um, in an attempt to kind of eliminate drawings which are quite problematic on construction sites. What you see here is one of those. It's a tool for producing very, very accurate, high quality brickwork and improving the, the skills of traditional craftsmen. Uh, this is happening right now down in Hobart in Australia. It's a, um, a project for the, the Hobart Hospital. And we have bricklayers who are not digitally literate by any stretch of the imagination, wearing also very expensive headsets on real construction sites, following very, very, very precise guides that enable them to produce real pieces of buildings with like a far higher degree of quality than what they could achieve working from traditional tools. And um, what we found is that these guys pick up the technology and embrace it in exactly the same way that they might with a string bob and a plumb line, because it doesn't really interfere with their normal way of working, and instead just, again, allows them to go a little bit further in terms of what they're capable of constructing. So that's really what we're interested in um, uh, in, our, in our company, in our practice called Fologram. It's about trying to enable, I guess, both architectural and design experimentation, which is, is sort of an interest in all forms of beauty, but also to, to improve um, you know, the way that we, we make uh, these experimental, crazy, risky designs. Uh, so, hi, my name is Igor Pantic. I'm a teaching fellow at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Um, and kind of like um, in the last decade, we have basically witnessed a rapid expansion of automation and uh, robotic fabrication processes in architectural production. So robotic 3D printing, ro robotic assemblies, and similar processes basically allow for creation of previously kind of unimaginable forms uh, of unprecedented complexity. Um, however, although these, all of these projects are very sophisticated both in uh, their design and execution, many of them uh, in a way pursue, in, in their pursuit of digital or automated, make a conscious and clear departure away from the craft, right? So kind of removing the human touch from the process uh, and at the same time giving up a degree of freedom and flexibility or intricacy and delicacy um, which, which is present in kind of these material crafting processes for centuries. Um, so even a brick wants to be something, says Louis Kahn, right? So with our students at the Bartlett, we ask ourselves kind of uh, what do different materials want to be? Um, materials often, often considered non-architectural, um, which, which are kind of low cost, um, on the fringes of architectural production, such as sawdust, synthetic ropes, felt, and so on. Um, so we take these traditional techniques as a starting point, and for example, like here, a needle felting technique in order to create uh, these kind of highly complex surface forms, or, or in this case, kind of looking at uh, use of sawdust and creating kind of uh, composite material uh, which is organized through uh, techniques of, of pinching and, and, and stitching, kind of dipping it in wood glue to create solid pieces and creating pieces like this, right? For example, this piece was completely created by hand. Uh, no machines were, were involved. <clears throat> Can we play the video? 
So we basically ask ourselves, how can we produce um, these, these complex digital models uh, with these complex digital models without using expensive machines. Uh, can we play the video, please? It's fine. Um, so, but obviously, this comes with kind of a, a, a different set of questions and limitations, right? Um, there's a question of pre precision, time, and also amount of data uh, that we can process and translate from a digital model to, to a physical model, like the one that you can see on the left-hand side. Um, but still kind of arguing for uh, production of architecture, which you would imagine that can only be produced by very expensive machines or, or machining processes, and arguing that this can be also crafted. <clears throat> so basically, we ask ourselves, what can be the answer, right? So we look at also, the other side of automation coin, uh, not only looking at the robotics, but also empowering the craft, um, empowering the human labor with mixed reality tools, uh, and arguing for expansion of what is considered to be automation, rather than competing only against the robotic fabrication. Uh, so, Sumin will now take over and explain this in a bit more detail through a project. This short video showcases our research projects pursued at the Bartlett taught by Alvaro Lopez, uh, Rod Rodriguez, and myself. The research project proposes a design-to-construction workflow pursued and enabled by augmented humans. Humans augmented by AR headsets, smartphones, devices, and potentially by wearable machines, wearable robots. In order to bridge the gap between purely automated construction processes on one hand, and craft-based material-driven but labor-intensive processes on the other hand. Our research spectrum includes the exploration of human-computer interaction through the use of computer vision recognition, machine learning, AR technology, generative computing, and so on. We also explore creative ways of using physical materials to create a unique fabrication system, often inspired by traditional crafting techniques. As Guyo and Igor stated earlier, although we have been witnessing rapid advancements in automation in construction, such as robotic assembly, 3D printing, and discrete architecture, digital fabrication research nowadays are often very limited when it comes to dealing with delicate and complex crafting processes Mechanic and robotic fabrication often oversimplifies parts, often giving ignorance to complex nature of making processes and unpredictability of material behaviors. Our project aims to expand the current paradigm of digital fabrication and question the way we see automation. We propose to rethink the role which human, machine, and computer should have in design and construction. We propose to do so by appreciating physical uh, properties of materials and nature of crafting processes. We propose to do so by appreciating the beauty of the infinite and highly controllable complexity and freedom provided to us today by technology and computer powers. Our world is dynamic, complex. Future is not singular and unexpected. And yes, beauty matters. Finally, academic environment is a good platform to test and experiment which, uh, with things which we are sometimes rather difficult to pursue in practice. In the project you see on the screen now, we explore few items that we didn't get to test in our uh, pavilion projects, for instance, outside, such as the adjustable mold, wooden brackets, and so on. We will keep on questioning and exploring. Steampunk Pavilion project did not finish, it just started. Thank you very much. So I'm not sure you had a, did you see their installation? I did, you did. I did. Good, yeah. I know, because you, you managed to arrive uh, last night. 
uh, as Elena just flew from LA. And by the way, it's your birthday. Happy birthday. Yes. It's her birthday today. And so so it's a <laughs> special day as well. And she was very kind to make it here and to run here. So uh, th how, how do you feel towards each other? For me, it's very always a very intriguing question because you're dealing with something very similar, but our application is quite different the way I see it. And, uh, and in a way, uh, also, I, I, I keep telling people that I'm fascinated by the way you met each other. I think I mentioned it earlier, but uh, being, you know, working as a team from such uh, distances and, you know, doing this together. But uh, it's all through, I see, AR and enable us lots of things. But is there anything that you feel that uh, bring a, a question or something or respond because you're both dealing with something very specific? Um, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask the question. I um, am wondering the do-it-yourself architecture project. Now, th there is a moment, I think, in everybody's career, which I th hopefully passed <laughs> with my birthday. Now. Um, that is, you got to have to do it on your own. And uh, because you have very little budget, and, uh, and in a way, I think the lack of means produces a lot of this in everybody's career. If you look at the architects in the past 20 years, we all have in the past things we did with our hands. And I'm not sure that this really will go into uh, ways of making professional work afterwards, but it's definitely, I think, a platform to produce something very early on in a career. I think it's more no, a mean to an end than actually an end. It's a very okay, good question, right. actually. Excellent. I couldn't it, disagree yeah. more. I mean, um, yes. there's, uh, the first slide of my presentation got skipped over, but it, it's a slide which is, I mean, the term augmented reality has always been imagined as being associated with making. So it was invented by two Boeing engineers in the early 1990s, and it was a system for assisting the very, very complex construction of aircraft wings by just showing a tiny bit of digital information within the space of a normal, everyday construction environment. Um, the problem back in the 90s is that all of the hardware just didn't exist that such that it didn't make you sick. So the workers could pr perform their tasks more efficiently, um, produce better aircraft wings, but they would also feel ill. Um, the, what we found in the last few years is the hardware's caught up. So now we're at the point where the bricklayers can wear these headsets, go about their ordinary construction tasks, but produce better work than they could without wearing the headset. I think um, that is going to fundamentally change the way that we build. It, it'll also change the way that we design, which is, I think, for these guys to answer. But on the construction end, we're already seeing like real adoption and real change. And, and I believe, as kind of I, I picked up on that a bit in the very short presentation, but I believe that augmented fabrication is only one side of the coin of automation, right? So I don't believe that robots are the answer to everything. But also, I don't believe that, auto that augmented reality fabrication would completely replace that type of production. Right? I, just, I see them more as complementing each other, with both of them having their strengths and weaknesses, kind of complementing in, in, in the way where they should be. I, I, I see it from a different angle, uh, as, you know, as I observe you working very hard. In a way, if the budget was larger, you would have unskilled builders using the AR, following your drawing, and doing the hard work. But because architects are so passionate about what they do, and if there's no budget, they do it by themselves. So that's how I saw it. Uh, you know, because there were other projects, you give it to a, you know, unskilled, la I thought the whole point is like an unskilled labor, you know, can follow and being helped by the AR with really drafted kind of drawings. So I, I, I'm, I'm quite fascinated by that and by the passion of architects willing to come here and Sumin, the only woman, I could see her injured and she did work, I, really hard work, hard labor, if first to bend the, the wood and then on site. I admired you for that, but I think it's really reflection on the passion and ambition to show that it's working. Because when I read about your entry, 
I appreciate its beauty, and I thought it's so attractive and very interesting. But I was a bit suspicious about the AR, how truthful it is, and how, you know, and I was amazed to see it on site, how it's really working wonderfully well. So, yeah, so I guess it's a... I, I mean, um, the, the do-it-yourself question is also really interesting, I think, um, because we, I don't think we could have gotten anybody else to do that particular project. We, we had to be there to to work out all of the problems in the making of, of the thing. We couldn't, we're not at the point yet where we can delegate to somebody else. Um, and I also think that the unskilled labor, um, this project's been a kind of a magnet for people who want to come and contribute and participate. It's a really participatory way of, of mm. constructing something, partly because it's so labor intensive, but partly because it is kind of a fundamentally new and exciting way of building and everybody wanted to see if we could actually <laughs> do it and like yourself Yal, it's this um, uh, curiosity around how, just how much the technology is really affecting the constructability of the thing and how much of it is maybe more of a kind of a, um, it's a virtual aspect of its, of its construction. So we had some fantastic volunteers who helped us and just wouldn't leave. They would volunteer for a week and then they'd stay for two months. Um, and I think that's, that speaks somehow to the, the, um, the, the sort of the value of the process and the learning through doing in, in yourself. Basically. Yeah, I, I also feel like uh, not the, the, from the other aspect uh, of human labor, I think, uh, for example, of our project, we couldn't have pulled out with robotic fabrication processes, for example. I think this was only able to be done uh, from this short amount of time, from the concept, establishing the concept to the pro uh, production of, of this uh, entire pavilion. Um, has been uh, really benefiting from the human labor that being able to uh, very intuitively make decisions and adopt different errors and uh, tolerances. I think this mm -hmm. process, uh, um, I think one of the interests we have is how to use the human ability uh, within this uh, digital uh, paradigm and I think this uh, is a very big aspect instead of um, only having uh, human uh, or unskilled labor. I think it's, it is also a very interesting aspect, but also we were using human ability in the making processes. Mm. So I think that's also a very important aspect in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes a helpful tool for very crafty work, again, not just the unskilled, but it depends on the project. That's very clear. So any question actually to Elena? Is I, I certainly have a, a question, if, if that's okay with you two. Um, because I think um, our work, at, or with this pavilion, we're trying to establish a kind of a counterpoint to what a lot of young practitioners are doing. And they're, they're getting interested in this kind of application of image onto surface in order to generate these sort of complex effects. It's this post-digital language of design rather than, it's, a, it's like a rejection of complex form making in favor of a complex application of, of effect and texture and pattern, which I see in your work, Elena. And I wonder whether if you had the tools to produce complex objects or um, forms or material systems like you might see in Igor's work, would you be interested in it? Or is there something in the, app, the surface effect which is also really, really kind of, um, Valuable. I guess, are you constrained by the tools of construction in your practice, is the simple question. I think everybody is. Um, and I think, him, I think it's, it truly is an issue of age. My most complex work probably was 20 years ago, where United States, I think, where I also trained and, and my first year of practice was much more complex, formally speaking. I think it's truly a career moment. I know you reject my statement, I think in 10 years from now, you might look back and understand that what I said had some value. Um, the work was probably formally more complex, and I also built it myself, probably. I also stopped doing that. Um, the project became larger, the clients became um, more... I mean, it, it became a completely different setting, where the architect takes on uh, a different role. Um, there are different liabilities, different aspects of the construction, and where the do-it-yourself doesn't apply anymore, and actually it's a great place to be where you don't have to 
do that. And actually, there is a much longer. Um, so I think the world changes according to the kind of opportunity and client you have if your ambition is architectural, not in the construction of the work. I mean, I, th I think it's a quite conscious decision making. I made myself at some point that I did not enjoy doing pavilions anymore. I thought it was and it is a finished project. Um, as I think it's a, almost a commercialized project by now, the pavilion, I think. Sorry to say. <laughs> I think Sylvia Living, I think, said this in the art forum in 2012, the vanishing point, uh, very well um, how art and architecture were uh, two fields that uh, complemented each other. And the pavilion was an important project because it reduced architecture of some constraint to be extremely experimental. And that project has become, just reached its limits. And now it's becoming a commercial project for, and I do agree to that extent that um, actually the most aggressive projects are the ones that are now with clients and projects. I mean, it's, I don't think the pavilion itself is, has the same, it was a liberating project at some point for architects that were producing a lot of buildings. Okay, the pavilion is the moment where you do it. Now it's become a form of practice. So it's, it's, you can tell some practitioners do that as a form of practice from Biennale to Biennale. Not the, that the pavilion is a moment where they are liberated from the constraint of the architectural reality. It's a very unprofitable practice model, if that's the case. I think. No, no, I understand. <laughs> I, uh, I completely understand that. I think we'll have to wrap up because time is out. But ah, very yeah. urgent if you have something. Well, I mean, I just wanted to add that we don't see this only as a pavilion, this pavilion that we, that we made. We more see it as a kind of a building system or, or way of applying the technology and the material research, which hopefully could be scaled up as well. So mm -hmm. it's not intended as just like a, a one-off or show-off. It's more of something that we see no, that no, could And be I think there is quite a bit of, I mean, yeah. ETH. I mean, there, there are hubs where this truly happens, I think, at a higher level that is um, with the research and the funds and the, uh, and the means that probably one needs to have in order for this to be entering the industry of building, which um, it, it also takes a step in, of entering into the code system and it, to actually make that happen in reality for, it needs to go through, I think, and a, a really deep, um, I don't know how to explain it, but um, it is not just the will of one person. It's a will of an industry to embrace uh, a technology. And it's not even only that. It's also the, the, the will of a country to change the code to accept that technology. So it's not, I mean, it takes time. And, 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 and only a few things remain, I think, in this process, in my experience. So only certain. Uh, certain one of these experiments then in 20 years become a new normal for practice. But I might, I might be old now, I feel like. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Elena, you can stay here because yeah. we have another one. And uh, Space Bob, you are. Thank you very much. Thank you.